Hi. In this video, we're going to review some of the important points about uh, Taylor series of complex functions. Now, you'll remember Taylor series from your second semester calculus class, most likely. Uh, you'll remember that a Taylor series is a, a power series where we take a function and we sort of write it as a sum of a bunch of powers of your variable. Now, the idea was that, uh, as we see here with these uh, Taylor uh, polynomials for the function sine of x, which is shown in black there, if we take a term, if, if we take a couple terms, so for instance, if I were to stop the series after that first term of the power series, I'd get sine of x is approximately equal to x, and the graph of f of x equals x is this function, and it kind of approximates the sine around zero. If I were to take x minus x cubed over three factorial and stop the series there, I would get this cubic, which does a little bit better job of approximating the sine. And the idea was that if you included more and more and more terms of your power series, you would get uh, polynomials that seem to match the function for longer and longer amounts of time, or, or would better fit the, uh, the function inside a certain range. Now, I'm assuming that you're familiar with that, and it will be important to remember some of these uh, series facts about sine of x, for instance, or 1 over 1 minus x. Remember, this was equal to the sum of all the powers of x. And it converged, the right-hand side converged, if and only if the um, absolute value of x was less than 1. All right, now, as we start looking at uh, power series representations of complex functions, uh, there are a couple things that will be very important for us to keep in mind. Um, the first is, which functions can be representable by power series? So let's suppose that f is a function, and it's defined within a circle centered at z0 with radius capital R, and R is a positive number. We're only going to be dealing with series with positive radius of convergence, or, or infinite. We won't be talking about series with a, a zero radius of convergence. Anyway, the idea is that if f is analytic um, inside this circle, then it's going to be representable by a power series, and vice versa. If there is a power series representation, this automatically guarantees that the function is analytic. The two go together. Now we can say a bit more than that. If there is a power series, then we can say that there is a unique one. There aren't two different series that give you the same function. And in fact, if there is a power series, we know exactly what the coefficients are going to be for that power series. You're going to just take the kth derivative of f, evaluate it at the center of the circle, and then divide everything by k factorial, where k is the index of the, uh, the coefficient you're dealing with. Now, uh, that's, that's important. Uh, we do know how to find these power series coefficients, no matter what, as long as f is differentiable, which analytic functions are. As long as we can find the derivative, we can compute these uh, coefficients. However, uh, the claim here is that there's a unique series representation. So even though this does tell us one way of finding the series, if there's another way of finding the series, we will know that whatever we end up with is the same thing we would have gotten if we had gone through and, and used this. So as your book mentions, uh, this coefficient is, is true. It won't always be useful for us, and we'll see an example in a few minutes. All right, the next thing we want to talk about is uh, what the radius of uh, convergence will be for these power series. So in the statement of our theorem, we suppose that you had a circle within which the, the power series uh, represented it, so the power series converged and the function was analytic inside that circle. Well, what if you had a function that was analytic and uh, you knew where it was analytic and you didn't necessarily specify a circle ahead of a time? Could you say something about the series? Well, the answer is yes. If we have uh, a domain in which our function is analytic, except at some uh, isolated singularities, then the radius of convergence of the power series will just be the distance from the center z0 to the nearest singularity of f, all right? So you don't have to find the radius of convergence by first finding the power series and then using the ratio test, which is how uh, you often did find uh, intervals of convergence in calculus two. Um, now what we can do even before we expand it in a series, we can just compare the distance, uh, find the distance between the center z0 and the nearest singularity, and that's all there is to finding the, uh, the radius of convergence. All right, let's take a look at an example. Suppose we're asked to find the Maclaurin series for this function, 
given by f of z equals 5 over 4 plus 8z. Now the Maclaurin series, you'll remember, is the, the power series expanded about the point 0. All right, now to start this out, um, you'll remember that uh, we can find the, the radius of convergence without even uh, expanding in a series. So let's do that first. We're describing the Maclaurin series, and one thing we can say is that since the center is 0, um, and the uh, singularity of this function, the only singularity, happens at z equals negative 1 half, the radius of convergence is going to be the distance between those two. So it's, the radius of convergence is 1 half. All right, now moving on, uh, we can remember that the series representation is uh, has its coefficients given by this expression. If we wanted to, as, as we compute this power series, we could take this as our function f, start computing its derivatives, evaluating at zero, and then dividing by the appropriate factorial, and that would tell us what the coefficients are for the individual terms in the power series. We might even notice a pattern, and that would give us a way of, of filling out a, a series in summation notation like this. However, um, as we mentioned, even though that is one way of doing it, any way we have, I mean, any valid way of finding a series representation will give us the same answer, because there is only one answer for the Maclaurin series. So let's see if we can use something else, a little bit more simple, to come up with the power series. And one of the tricks that you'll find very helpful is to take your series and somehow uh, write it in a way that fits a power series you're already familiar with. So here is one of the vital power series that you ought to keep in mind. 1 over 1 minus z is the sum of all the non-negative powers of z. Or in other words, it's the sum of z to the k, where we sum from k equals 0 to k uh, up to infinity. Now this is a valid power series whenever the modulus um, z is uh, less than 1. And so we're going to take our, our function, we're going to try and write it in this format, 1 over 1 minus z. Now the way we'll do that is by taking this expression, and we're noticing that there's a 4 in the bottom and there's a 5 in the top, and we'd like to have a 1 and a 1, so we'll factor 5 fourths out of everything. Now in the numerator, you just simply pull the 5 out of 5, and that leaves a 1. In the denominator, we'll factor a 4 out of everything we see, and that will leave us with a 1 plus 2z. Now because the uh, formula has a minus z, I would like to see a minus there, so I'll rewrite that plus 2z as minus negative 2z. Now we know what the series expansion is for this, so we can sort of plug into that series expansion what we see here, with the minus 2z. All right, so as we do that, uh, We'll just put the minus 2z in place where there was a z to the k. And as we uh, rewrite that a little bit, we'd like to kind of separate the z from the coefficient. So I'll put the negative 2 uh, with its own exponent of k, and then z with its own exponent of k. I'm going to bring the 5 fourths inside the series to group it all together into one coefficient. And that would be good enough. But if you wanted to, you could also notice that 4 is equal to negative 2 squared. So I can uh, cancel the bottom with uh, 2 of the minus 2's up top and this will give me an expression for the Maclaurin series representation of the function 5 over 4 plus 8z. All right, now as you go along and you find uh, other Maclaurin series or Taylor series, um, you'll see that there are a few things that will help you a little bit farther, and they're, they're important theoretical points, so we'll mention them here. They are this. Um, suppose that you have a function that is represented by a power series within a circle of convergence. Then, uh, with the same circle of convergence in every every case, the power series for the derivative of f is going to be what you would get if you just took the derivative of each of these terms in the original series. Furthermore, if you wanted to integrate the function f along any contour c, all you have to do is integrate each of these terms individually along c, and whatever answer you would have gotten on the left is equal to the series you would have gotten the series summing up all those integrals on the right. Now in particular, you know that we defined the antiderivative, or we, we show that you could get an antiderivative for a, an analytic function by taking a particular uh, integral definition. And that tells us that if we uh, are dealing with a function that's analytic in a domain, the antiderivative will have a power series that we get just by taking the antiderivatives of the individual terms and uh, being very careful with the constant where, where appropriate. 
All right. Now, in particular, uh, that first bullet point can be represented or illustrated by this example. We just previously saw that 5 over 4 plus 8z was equal to this particular power series. What the first bullet point is saying is that if we take the derivative on the left-hand side, we can take the derivative of the individual terms on the right-hand side, and the equation will still be true inside that circle of convergence. So this function here is equal to this function, uh, this series on the right. Now, I've got here the sum starting from 1 to infinity, because remember that the uh, k equals 0 term corresponded to a constant term here. And when I take the derivative, constant terms just turn to 0, and so I leave off the k equals 0 term. Now, it's a, a little bit uh, cut off, but uh, the series below starts at k equals 0. You'll notice that what I did is rewrite this as a series in terms of z to the k rather than z to the k minus 1. Maybe I want to take the power series for this and write it in terms of z to the k, so it matches my definition there. To do that, what I will do is shift my index. I'm going to have the series start at k equals 0 rather than k equals 1. And when I push the k down in the limits, I'll need to compensate by pushing these k's up. And so the k to the minus 1 to the k will become a k, and this k minus 2 will become a k minus 1. If that's a little bit hazy for you, um, please uh, go ahead and consult some Calculus 2 books. Um, we, we're talking there about shifting of ind indices uh, on summations. All right, in the next video, we're going to take a look at a few more examples of uh, functions where we're asked to find a, a Taylor series or Maclaurin series. We'll see some tricks for how to get that done efficiently and, and well. See you there.